from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and have always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. I've been keto now for over two years and it has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women, maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs under 20 grams a day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like dairy. Moderate protein scale to your lean body mass and then fat to satiety. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalized keto. I'll be asking my guests each week what their keto looks like to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we can't give you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Okay, so we are running into the last week of the Keto Fest Kickstarter. So who best to talk to me about it than the two keto dudes? Hello, dudes. Hey. Hello. (laughs) <laughs> so tell us, I know exactly why I don't want to miss out on Keto Fest, but tell everyone else why they just can't bear to miss out this year on Keto Fest 2019. It's a big party with science and social activities and hanging out with all manner of people just like you. And cooking. And cooking. And great food. Great keto food. Yeah. It's a conference like no other, and it's a festival like no other. I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize. One, there's real proper food there. (laughs) You're going to get fed really, really well. Yes. While we're on that subject, tease us a little. Tell us what we're going to get. Well, just like in the last couple of years, we're doing a pig roast on Social Saturday, and that's going to be smoking all night. Sacurelli farm where they raise their own pigs and they do their own smoking and it'll be transported in the morning. And we're also having a grill with burgers with, you know, cheese and bacon burgers and fixins. And those are going to be served on Fox Hill kitchens buns. Um, we'll also have my famous keto clam chowder and coleslaw mm-hmm. and uh, mystic meat locker is going to be there. We didn't mention them, but they were there the last couple of years too. They're doing like grilled sausages that they make without sugar and they make their own sausages. And they also have some charcuterie, which you can sample. Oh, I think those sausages, were those the sausages that were at the staff party on the Sunday? Yeah, those were the ones that were left over. Oh man, those were amazing yeah (laughs) i had one of those yeah and they're all local they're all local people so that that's just on the parade plaza now at rd86 space richard carrie myself and a few other people are going to be doing cooking demonstrations of dishes absolutely and that's carrie's domain so why don't you tell us a bit about that carrie well to be honest at this point we have decided who but we don't have collected the what yet but I can assure you that you're going to learn a lot you're going to learn some great cooking tips and tricks and of course we're going to feed you all of the things we show you how to cook as well right you get to sample it's not just that you get to watch us make it but you get to sample what we made we're going to make covers 
for as many people as want them. And if you're one of those wonderful Keto Fest attendees who like to volunteer, you might be helping me, Kim, and other people. Last year, were slaving away in the kitchen yeah. making those samples. It was a lot of hard work, but it was a whole lot of fun that, too. That so. kitchen was a was a riot. <laughs> It was, wasn't it? <laughs> Kim and I had serious cankles and we overheated every day, but <laughs> what fun it was. It's the it's a camaraderie and I yeah. think that is a key part of Keto Fest in general, isn't it? It's this real feeling for everyone of yeah. belonging to the festival and vice versa. That's right. But you also get to enjoy the wonder that is Southern Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You're, we're right close to the beach. In fact, one of the activities that we have on Social Saturday is a walk to the beach, which is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. The weather will be fantastic. And it really is just the most delightful place to spend a long weekend. So if you've never been to Connecticut, you are really missing out just on that front. Because you've properly fallen in love with the place, haven't you, Carrie? I have. I, I, I'm not a homegrown nutmegger like Mr. Franklin. I'm a very new implant and I absolutely love living here. So in addition to the food stuffs, um, some of the other social activities on Saturday include uh, fitness lessons on the grass with Alan Meisner. He does a fitness podcast for people over 40. That's right. 40 plus fitness. And he's really big on not relying on gear to do it. You know, kind of like the, the CrossFit guys, only his exercises just use gravity and they're, they're more gentle than, uh, you know, the, the CrossFitters. So he's, he's really great. He's going to be doing that. We may have um, yoga lessons also in that same place in between the fitness lessons. Um, we will also have walking tours of historic New London. There's a New London agency that offers walking tours. Just, you know, first come, first serve, sign up. But that they'll go in groups of 20 and, and show you the historic. You know, New London is the place where the Amistad came to, which was the slave ship where, uh, that uh, suffered a revolt, <laughs> if you remember from history or the movie. And uh, there's a lot of other great historical things about New London. We also might get the Segway people back this year. They, the, we didn't do the Segway tours last year because the people in charge came ill and uh, weren't able to coordinate it. But uh, I think we're going to get them back again this year. Then the Big thing is Saturday night, we've got the restaurants in town, more of them this year than, than in years past, to participate by offering ketogenic meals on their menu. And we will actually print the meal options, you know, the dish options in the program that everybody gets. So you don't even have to go from place to place to decide. You can look at all of them and say, ah, that looks good. I'll go to this restaurant. And I have to say, from from my experience, that worked fantastically. I mean, as you know, I had a big meetup for my Facebook group. I th mm. I can't remember how many of us were at Hot Rods, but something mm. like forty, if if not more. Yeah. And Rod really, really did us proud, and he's he's going to host us there again this year. And that was a lot of fun, and the food was to die for. It yep. was fantastic. But I know there are all sorts of other things available around town. I've talked to the guys at the social. They had a few things on the menu, but they weren't really hip to it last year. This year, I'm getting them involved so that they have some, you know, ribeyes and and some other things mm. that everybody likes on the menu. So we'll we'll have at least three or four places that have good meats. And uh, I'm actually going to, and I haven't done this yet, but I'm going to talk to the guys across from Daddy Jack's, across Pearl Street, not across Bank Street, but they have a noodle shop. It was like a noodle place. And I'm going to share my recipe with them and hopefully they can put that on the menu as a, a gluten-free, nice. low-carb noodle. Fantastic. And Lest we forget, all three of us being podcasters, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday is when we have live podcasts as well. That's right. We're going to set up a, a room where you can go and watch podcasters do their thing live. 
And they were super fun and super popular last year. Mm -hmm. It was really good fun. I have to say, from from my point of view, it was absolutely terrifying also. (laughs) I'm used to hiding away in my bedroom, but it was was incredibly good fun. Science Sunday happens the next day, and that is your typical low-carb conference. You have talks by uh, people. We have confirmed a few people. Should we mention them now? Yes, please. Dave Feldman and Siobhan Huggins, they're going to be there each doing a talk. Ken Berry, Dr. Ken Berry is going to be there. Uh, Amy Berger is going to be there. Amber O'Hearn, Nadir Ali, Peter Ballersted. Those are just the people who have absolutely confirmed. Other ones want to and are just clearing their calendar and they'll get back to us. Yes, and that's where it's it's tricky with the Kickstarter, isn't it? We kind of need right. to get the funding before we can absolutely confirm. Mm-hmm. But I know lots of people have been asking me, well, who's going to be speaking? So it's really good to just throw some names out there. To and I got to I got to mention, we have asked uh, Professor Stephen Finney, but we haven't heard back from him yet. And it turns Exciting. out that he grew up in Connecticut. Really? He did. Yeah, a little further north. Well. He needs to have a homecoming then. (laughs) Yeah, he was totally into the idea. Fantastic. Of course, it might be Science Sunday and it might be more like your average conference, but outside there's food. (laughs) Yes, that's right. An all-day bacon bar. So that comes out like at 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, just bacon, bacon, bacon. Of course, Julie Fox McClure from Fox Hill Kitchens will be making grilled cheese sandwiches on uh, her buns. But fingers crossed we have a new product that everyone's going to get to taste, haven't we? Yeah. Are you talking about the tomato basil soup? I am. (laughs) That's from the guys at Keto Chow. They have a tomato basil soup that they're, they're thinking of bringing. And Yum. so grilled cheese, bacon sandwiches dipped in tomato soup. Oh, yeah. Oh, what a great combination. And I have to say, I'm probably getting a little bit of a broken record on this, but how incredibly lovely are the Keto Chow people? <laughs> they are so nice. Yeah, they really are. I do not have enough words to express how wonderful those people are. I, I just, they... I don't know how many of you know this, but when we were in Denver at Low Carb Denver recently, the Keto Chow people fixed my car. My four-wheel drive had gone out. and Just um, because they're nice. They just took care of it for me. Yeah. They did. Plus, you were staying with them as well. They drove us around all over the place and were always there with smiles and hugs. Just lovely people. Pleasure to be around. Yes. Getting back to the food on Sunday, we forgot to mention that there will be a main dish that will be some sort of protein other than pork. Uh, It'll be beef, chicken, or lamb because, you know, people get kind of porked out with all the bacon and the pig roast and all that stuff. I don't don't get that, personally. (laughs) I (laughs) I never get porked out. (laughs) Yeah, we'll have some sort of main dish there. So in a real nutshell, what's the one thing? The one thing that really people have to come to Keto Fest because... The community. Everybody else that comes to Keto Fest. You, you want to meet the people that come to Keto Fest because they're awesome. Yeah. Let me tell you something. The people in the town who have the businesses and the restaurants and stuff said the Keto Fest group was the nicest group of people, the most intelligent, smart, conversational Uh, I remember Charlotte Hennigan, who owns Thames River Greenery, telling me that that was her best day, not just uh, of sales in 20 years, but her best day talking to customers. She loved talking to the keto people. It's amazing the difference that it makes to your entire life when you feel better, when you're not sick, when you don't hurt, when you're not having headaches, when you're not carrying around a ton of extra weight, when when all of those annoying symptoms go away, it's amazing how that can affect your whole life. And spending a weekend surrounded by all those people who have helped, had the same benefits is just, for me, that's the the biggest blessing of Keto Fest. Oh, I almost forgot. On Social Saturday, Pamela Zorn is going to do cheese-making demonstrations at Thames River Greenery. 
that has proven to be a, a really popular thing. As well, the Thames River Greenery is going to be doing wine and cheese tastings. You know, they're they're really dry wines, and they have a cheese shop right there, and so they do those all day long. Cheese. What's, what's better than that? Yeah, I know. wine and cheese. And community, you're absolutely right. And that's that's been the thing for me as well that's just taken it to a whole different level. Right. You know, I was part of the community for a couple of years before I got to meet anyone in person really mm. to speak of. And yeah. I loved being a part of it then. But getting to meet people just takes the whole thing to a whole different level. It really level does. For me. Yeah. I loved it too. And, you know, every year it gets better for me personally, because the first year I, I took on a lot of the work myself. The second year we had this army of volunteers, which we plan to do again this year. This year I hope to be able to spend more time with the people just doing things and not having to run around like a chicken with my head cut off. I keep forgetting about all these things we're doing on Saturday. Here's another one. <laughs> we want to have a microphone uh, on the parade plaza where the seating is, where the whale tail is. And you just think of like, you know, stone seats that, that are tiered so that you can sit down and watch. And we're going to have regular people just get up and tell their stories. That and I sick. think that's going to be so inspirational. Um, last year we had a band. We may do that again. We may do something else. I'm not sure. But we will have music of some kind there. We'll let you know about that. The Social Saturday is really the glue that keeps uh, all the Keto Fest people together. And then, you know, on Science Sunday, it's just, ah, oh, you know, you satisfy, satisfy the other half of your brain. It really sets the tone, doesn't it? And, and gets the community together. But right. we have completely forgotten to talk about <laughs> what comes before Social Saturday. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Two things. Talking of setting the tone and getting everyone started. I know. Started. Let's do it in reverse, everyone right? Everyone starts on Friday. <laughs> yeah, we're just we're doing it in reverse. We're doing it the other way around. Right. Friday <laughs> is called Fasting Friday, and Megan Ramos is coming down, and she will do some lecture and some talks showing the latest data, clinical data from IDM, talking about patient stories, giving people tips for fasting, answering questions. And we will have throughout the day activities that aren't food centric, like a walk to the beach, like walks around town, like yoga and all of those things that people can do socially, but fasted, not eating all the time. Because, you know, it's a challenge if you're coming to Social Saturday and you're fasting, it's a food centric day, right? So we want to have a, a day for anybody to do these activities on Friday. And, uh, and just enjoy each other's company. Followed by the VIP party at my house, which is always off the chain. It's so much fun. And I think I, I set the standard for expectation of something that I think we're going to have to do again this year. Mm. I was determined to introduce Americans who weren't familiar with the wonders of clotted cream yeah, that's right. <laughs> Two clotted cream. So we are going to have to make that again because it, it went down a storm, didn't it? I, th I seem to remember yes. watching Ken Berry go back for more <laughs> with his dessert plate and just load up on clotted cream. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's delicious. And also um, this year I'm going, I've decided I'm going to make lasagna with my bazoodles, mm. my keto noodles. Yum. They're called bazoodles. And I've had this lasagna. I made it with Pam Zorn, and um, this recipe was so good, I feel no need to change it. So uh, it's going in my cookbook, and we're going to serve that lasagna at the VIP party. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have to just have a, a quick shout out to Pam. We're recording this earlier than it's going to go out, but Pam is very, very sick at the moment. And she oh, yeah. went to great lengths to host us when we were at Low Carb Denver and mm. did so much cooking and, yeah, went to, went to such lengths to just have a wonderful, wonderful evening for all of us. Yeah, she and was amazing. And she's such a big part of Keto Fest. So, Pam, if you're listening, 
I hope you feel better now. <laughs> yes, definitely. I guess that's all I got. Carrie? Join us. <laughs> yes, join us. You know you want to, and <laughs> the party will be better if you're there. Absolutely. It really will. Well, I look very much forward to seeing you two, but everyone else who's listening, who's coming, we'll see you in Connecticut, New London. The weekend of July 20th. See you then. Okay. See ya. Thank you, Richard Strang, for supporting me and this podcast by making a pledge at my Patreon page. Would you like to hear your name here at the top of the show? Are you enjoying this podcast and would like to help me make more episodes? Then head over to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. It means a great deal to me and you'll get to headline the show just like Richard did today. This week's Extraordinary Woman is Michaela Peterson. Michaela was really sick from the age of two and was prone to getting infections, colds, etc. She was diagnosed with severe rheumatoid arthritis when she was just seven and ended up with multiple joints replaced by the age of 17. She took antidepressants for severe depression and anxiety and suffered from idiopathic hypersomnia. She had itchy skin starting at age 14 that she just ignored, but these developed into cystic acne by 19. Then Michaela started experimenting with diet, and now she is in remission from everything. She no longer takes any medications or vitamins. The hardest thing to get rid of was the depression, but that's gone now too. Now she only eats beef, salt and drinks water. She has been eating like this since December 2017 and says she will never go back because she feels amazing. This is the last of the three interviews I recorded at CarnivoryCon. The conference and the fantastic presentations inspired me to start my own carnivore challenge. I'm going for 90 days of meat, eggs, salt and water only. It's been a week now and I've eased in somewhat gently by tapering the coffee, which ran out last Sunday, and now my green tea, which I've just drunk the last cup of because it runs out today. Eek. <laughs> you may remember the discussion I had with Amber a few episodes ago, number 70, if you haven't listened already, about my liquid intake possibly being a bit high and that potentially is affecting the electrolyte levels in my system. Well, I figured that restricting what I drink just down to water would be the most likely way to get the level where it should be. I think it's been the hardest part to give up so far anyway. I'm going to start doing a weekly vlog about it on my YouTube channel, which also has all the podcast episodes loaded if you like to listen on that platform. You can find the channel under my name, Daisy Brackenhall, so go check it out. Oh, and please subscribe, of course. I want to thank Michaela, Sean and Peter for taking the time to record with me. I had a blast. Thanks also for inspiring me and many others to try this meaty way of eating. Welcome, Michaela, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed watching your presentation. Perhaps you could share with the viewers a bit about yourself. Um, well, we're at the carnivore conference and I was put up first, which was a little bit nerve wracking. Yeah, um, you handled yourself well. Thank you. There were a couple of technical difficulties, but we got through it. Yeah, it was fun. I can't believe I almost started crying. That never happens. <laughs> so, but so yeah, I think I was nervous, but um, it was good. I think it adds to it, though. It does. I know. I, I've watched my dad, and he does that on stage, and I'm like, oh, dad, come on. <laughs> it's real, but like, anyway, uh, that's never happened before, so. <laughs> it was good, though, and there are a lot of people here. There are. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's out. Uh-huh. It's fun. It's, it's nice fabulous, venue. isn't it, though? The, the first carnival conference. I know, It's really right? exciting. And it'll be bigger next year, I think. Absolutely. It's going to yeah. go from strength to strength. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about you. You've got a fascinating story. I'm 27, and I was super ill since I was two. I had symptoms since I was two, but I was formally diagnosed with uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis when I was seven. I was on immune suppressants, um, Enbrel, methotrexate, naproxen, and then... Uh, it was just like one thing after another, worsening health um, up to 22 when I started looking at diet. So I was put on SSRIs for really severe depression um, when I was in grade five. 
I ended up with chronic fatigue um, when I was 14, and that wasn't diagnosed formally until I was 22. When I was 17, even on all the medications I was on, I needed a hip and ankle replacement. So I spent like a year on OxyContin getting the hip and re- ankle replacements done because there's a like a waiting list in Canada, so I had to wait for it. And then I had to take an extra year of high school because of all the school I missed, and I eventually went to university, and then I started just eating like a university student does, which was just terrible looking back on it. But I was like, (laughs) I was finally free of my parents and I was like, well, do I want to eat like eggs for breakfast or do I want to survive off of cinnamon toast crunch? I was like cinnamon toast crunch and ginger ale and noodles. And I got like my mental health deteriorated really quickly. It, um, It was already really bad to begin with, but it got so much worse just like the first month of changing my diet that dramatically. Um, And I didn't know that that's what it was. I was like, I just moved out. I was living with a roommate who was a crazy person, probably not as crazy as I was at that time, but he was, I thought he was my issue because he was just making me so angry. And then I was like in relationships that were upsetting. School was stressful. So I thought it was just from the change. But now looking back on it, I know it was because I was just eating terribly. Um, So for the next two years, I like kind of continued to eat like that. um, And I started gaining weight, which had never happened before. And then it started hitting my skin. Um, So I started getting like rashes and my skin was breaking out and it was kind of like acne, but it wasn't. Um, and I went to doctors and they tried to figure out if it was bacterial and it wasn't. And then they suggested it was me just doing it to myself from anxiety. Um, oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's often the fallback, isn't it? Yeah. Especially this sort of area of issues because they're so hard to pin down. Yeah. Well, quite anything often they just gets don't, put on you. Don't know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I. I was called, at one point I was called a hypochondriac because I got, this was like in my early, early 20s, um, and I started getting really tiny itchy blisters on my fingers, and I was like, this is bad. Okay, this shouldn't happen to a person. Itchy blisters are a bad sign of something. They're like, oh no, you're being a hypochondriac. I was like, what? I physically have blisters on my fingers. (laughs) This is a bad sign. Um, But yeah, there was a lot of, especially with the chronic fatigue, um, I got a lot of hell and my parents feel bad about it now, especially once I was diagnosed. But for a solid six, seven, I'd say eight years, it was, you know, pull yourself together and get out of bed. Um, And I was like, well, maybe everyone just experiences this level of fatigue and they're just stronger people than me. But then I was diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia and um, put on Adderall. But when I was 22, I... um, decided uh, this was after going through like every doctor I could find to deal with this skin problem. Cause that was the one that was really like, now that I look back, I know my anxiety was worsening too, but the skin is what I was obsessing over. Um, cause it was affecting how people saw me on the outside and everything else before that was kind of invisible. Um, so I'd gone through like every medical route I could go through and I, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And so I figured I had to figure out what was going on myself. So, um, At that point, I had moved in back with my parents. I switched schools. I switched programs and went into biomedical science and was like, if this takes me like 10 years, I'm just going to study and figure out what's wrong. seems to be quite a common thread with people who have issues that they're struggling either to get diagnoses for or to get fixed. They start trying to figure it out themselves. Yeah. And study where necessary and do whatever they can to just figure it out themselves and find their own solutions. Yeah. Well, at a certain point, like if you go, you know, you're told go to the doctor if something's wrong. And if you go to the doctor and they don't help you, and then you go to like 20 other doctors and none of them help you at some point, you're like, okay, if I've done this the right way 20 times and it hasn't worked, then I have to do something different. Um, So yeah, I figured that out when I was about 20 and had lost, I had already kind of lost faith in the medical community um, a number of times. Um, When I was 17, I really, really needed painkillers for the hip and ankle replacement. Um, I couldn't sleep. The pain was so bad, and I couldn't put my hip in a position that didn't hurt. 
So it's I a w- pretty young age to 17. have such a, a big was, operation. It sounds like your your whole childhood was plagued with all sorts of kind of medical interventions. Must be like, difficult to deal with. Well, looking back, yeah, it was. But when you're a kid and you're sick, it's not as hard as when you're an adult and you're sick. Like it's just, and looking back, I know I was sick. Like I went to see the rheumatologist. I guess I went to see her every six months. I got blood tests monthly. I gave myself injections weekly, um, like multiple injections weekly. And I saw my family doctor probably once a week. Like I was in the medical system, but it was normal. I had never experienced anything different. And then when I got older, it was like, oh, this is annoying. In a lot of ways, it was easier as a kid, which is something like I wrote a blog um, post about it. And it was about, you know, if you have a sick kid and how hard is that for a parent? And like when we used to go to the rheumatologist, my mom used to cry every time we went. And like, I'd bring my stuffed animal and she'd hold it and cry. And I'd be sitting on the table and be like, eh, and she's just like poking around at my joints. Yep. That one hurts. That one hurts. That one hurts. But mom would be like crying. So I know what you mean. Actually, yeah. Kids are actually pretty resilient and just go with what's happening Yeah, without, I guess, we understanding start the ramifications. It. Yeah, absolutely. When we get older. Apparently when I was first diagnosed, uh, I was diagnosed and my parents were told, you know, rheumatoid arthritis juvenile rheumatoid arthritis this means multiple joint replacements at a young age and i had no idea what that meant at all and like 30 because they they suggested the joint replacements would happen when i was around 30 30 when you're in grade two is like a really old person (laughs) so it didn't bother me but when you're an adult and you understand what that means and like how much suffering that actually is it's harder so i didn't have like when I, I had a hard time as a teenager because my mental health, even with the antidepressants, um, it was pretty hard. Like it deteriorated, but it wasn't really until I grew up more in my twenties that I understood how bad this was and that it was like really starting to kill me. So, so you saying you were having a lot of pain with it and you needed to get painkillers with the hip and ankle replacement. Yeah. The first time I really lost faith in the medical community was, um, I stopped being able to sleep because of the hip pain and I was on the waiting list for a hip replacement. And I went to my rheumatologist who I'd been seeing since I was in grade two. And I said, I need some pain. Like my parents were like, she needs painkillers. And my uh, grandpa had come and he had been taking Tylenol three like daily for back pain. And he was like, oh man, she can't sleep. So he'd given me Tylenol three uh, and I could actually sleep. So he went to the rheumatologist and said, you know, she needs pain medication. And my rheumatologist said, have you tried ibuprofen? And it was like, I have no cartilage in my hip and I need a hip replacement like yesterday and I can't sleep. And you're asking me if I popped an ibuprofen. It's not going to cut it. I tried the (laughs) ibuprofen. It doesn't do anything. She said she had had a bad experience putting somebody on pain medication um, and he hadn't been able to get off of it very well. So she just didn't prescribe it anymore. And I was like, I'm like um, that year before... That pretty much, well, for like at least a six month period, I was suicidal with pain. It was so awful. So we ended up going to a walk in clinic and they don't normally prescribe pain medication. And that walk in doctor, thank God, um, took me in as a patient and he gave me pain medication. Um, and you have to be a pretty brave doctor to prescribe like the amount of pain medication I needed that year to a 17 year old. And he did it. And that probably saved my life. And it was horrible getting off of it because I'd taken it for a whole year, but I did it. So it was fine. But that was the first time I think where I went to a doctor and they were like, you know, we can't help you. She had referred me to the pain clinic at, at the sick kids hospital. And it was an eight week period, waiting time period to get to the pain clinic. It's like, what am I supposed to do for eight weeks? Not sleep? So that was like the first step. So by the time I was 22, I had not been told this was all in my head in enough times, which is shocking considering I had like joints replaced. I lost a lot of faith in the medical community. So yeah, I decided to start researching myself. So you're at college and you've got all these other things that start going on. And I know um, from watching interviews that that you've done online, I've watched on YouTube and things, you started trying to experiment with your diet and, and how that was going to help. Yeah, I um, first I, well, I was looking at... <laughs> skin disorders to try and see what was going on with my skin and I came across uh it's called dermatitis herpetiformis and it's um 
itchy blistering rash you can get when you have celiac disease. So I did genetic testing. I was like, I came up with the gene. And in order to be tested in the medical community for celiac disease, they do biopsies. And I was like, well, I'll just yeah, cut out gluten. Yeah, because the blood test isn't very reliable, is it? Well, no. They, the blood test tests for the gene. So you can rule it out, but you can't really say somebody has it. Uh, and I thought, well, I don't want the, the biopsies have a very high false negative rate because you have to actually biopsy a sample that, you know, is diseased. Um, and I was like, oh, I don't want to do a bunch of biopsies. I'll just cut out the gluten and maybe all my problems will go away. And that was 2015 and it maybe it helped a little bit, but not really. Uh, and then, yeah, I went on an elimination diet. So you're, um, it wasn't actually a, a keto diet, really. It was um, like root vegetables without potatoes because I cut out nightshades. I basically just cut out, I came up with this diet <laughs> and cut out everything that I thought people would be allergic to. So I was eating rice because I thought, everyone can eat rice. Um, everyone can eat like meat and fish and everyone can eat like root vegetables and a like apples. Um, that seems pretty safe. It's logical. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that was me not knowing anything about like paleo or keto or anything. And it, I did it for a week and nothing really obvious happened. And <laughs> I don't know why I thought a week was a good cutoff point, <laughs> but, um, I tried to reintroduce something and I had, I had, um, like gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free banana almond muffins. And two days later, my knees were in so much pain, I couldn't walk. So I was in bed for a couple of days after that. And I thought, oh my God, that never happens. I never had flare-ups like that. Oh, and at this point too, when I cut out gluten, I stopped taking my arthritis medication because I was in pain on the medication. Like I was taking Tylenol 3 to sleep because of my shoulder pain. Um, and I never really felt it was working. And I had had my joints replaced on the medication. So I was like, you know what? In order to give this gluten-free thing a real shot, I'm just going to stop the medication. I didn't tell my rheumatologist. Um, I just quit everything. Um, I was still taking a, like Adderall and an SSRI and birth control and Tylenol 3. But I stopped the arthritis medication. So when I had that flare-up um, where I couldn't walk for a couple days, it was pretty abnormal. Um, that hadn't happened before. So I really dove into diet after that. And that month, um, I went down three pant sizes and I lost five pounds, which confused me. And my skin started to heal and my joints were pretty good, but mostly it was like my skin started to heal and I, I lost like mass. <laughs> um, I was like, that was bloating? Like what? And then for the next... Well, and then a couple of months later, my depression lifted, which I hadn't even thought was possible. I thought, okay, arthritis, skin issues. Okay. But no, the depression is like a, that's a chemical thing. And I'm stuck with that forever. My dad has it. My grandpa has it. That's not diet related. Yeah. Just the way your brain's wired. Yeah. Right. And, and it had like run in my family. So we're like, oh, some genetic, like something's genetically wrong. And that's just how I'm stuck on this medication forever. And a couple months into this lower carb than what I'd been doing before, I was still eating rice, but I mean, I was eating a lot of meat and a lot of vegetables and a little bit of rice. My depression started to lift and I went off of my antidepressants. And when I went off of my antidepressants, I went off of all my medication. At the same time as my depression started to lift, my fatigue went away and my itching stopped. So all my symptoms and symptoms I hadn't even considered were symptoms. Like it didn't take very long, but like six months into this diet, well, first I went off of the antidepressants and I stopped eating rice because I noticed rice was upsetting my digestion. I didn't notice anything other than that. Just I was making me feel overly full. So I stopped the rice um, and then I started to try and re reintroduce foods. And at first I went to what I was craving and missing and what I had been eating before a lot. And I went to soy and I ate so much soy. It was like tofu, miso soup, like as much soy as I could eat. And I had like a terrible, it was like 15 minutes and I got bloated and my body was just like, I'm not having any of this. And um, I was like, okay, no more soy, I guess. And then about five hours later, my entire body got itchy. And the next morning the depression was back and it was worse than I had like ever experienced. And it got worse for about four days and it stuck around for three weeks. And it was so bad that like I woke up the next morning and I got into the shower and I just like bawled. I was like, how could I be so stupid to think that something as serious as depression was caused by food? How could I be so naive? And then I was like, no, no, it was gone yesterday. Then I had a whole bunch of this. And then I like, I had a stomach ache and then I got itchy and now I'm upset. 
I don't like upset is putting putting it very lightly. I was like distraught. I was like it's definitely it's definitely a, a reaction, but it's hard when you're depressed because you just get all those negative thoughts spiraling. Exactly. So there's sort of two sides, isn't it? You've got the emotional stuff is overtaking, but then the luckily logical. you had that little logic voice oh, man, was still was there, hard, strong though. enough to it tell was, you. It was kind of like um, I kept really extensive notes on my phone, so I was just rereading the notes, like. No, this is the pattern that happened. But it, like for three weeks after that, um, it, it got so bad, like a couple of days later. So the depression hit, I'm crying and it's just getting worse. I'm like, well, maybe it'll go away in a couple of days. Um, the day after that, so two days after I had soy, um, I like momentarily hallucinated. Uh, I was trying to remember which was the food. It was the soy. That it was the soy that but did that. That, was that also, sounded really scary. That was probably that was the like the scariest thing that's ever happened to me it was like nighttime and i couldn't i was doing really badly and i said julian can you drive me back to my julian's my brother can you drive me back to my apartment i don't think i can drive um like i don't know what's going on but i'm too like i couldn't see very well like things were very weird and he dropped me off and i walked to my door and i turned around um to like wave goodbye and he looked at me and his face turned into like a demon face and it was long enough that he looked at me and then he looked back and started driving away. And then it was my brother again. And I was standing at my door and I was like, okay. So like looking in my purse, being like, I hope my keys are in here. Um, and I went upstairs into my bedroom and I turned on all the lights and I like hid under my blankets and um, I smoked a bunch of weed <laughs> because I was having like panicking. And it was, and I don't know, I stayed under my blankets all night and then I I don't even know what I thought about the next week. My skin broke out. Um, I was itchy for about two weeks and so this is this real sort of snowball effect. It seems. Yeah. You, and you it, know, you had these symptoms like within a few hours and you must've thought, okay, well that's the extent of it. Yeah. But how are you to know that all these other things were, were going to start yeah. stacking up? What did you think at that time? See, I assume you, you still got that little logical voice, but what was that voice telling you when you got these couple of seconds when you saw a demon. Was there something that oh, I was logically like, was that enough was... to tell you oh, for that sure. this was some would... kind of loose? But Oh, for sure. What did you think? I mean, it must have been I was at terrifying. the door. I thought, okay, I just saw a demon face. <laughs> I was like, I hope my keys are in here because I want to go to my bedroom now. And I was walking up the stairs. I was like, that just happened. That just like, that wasn't real. And that just happened. And that was it. Like I knew, I, I, I knew it was a hallucination, but I was like, something is wrong. I was like, now I'm crazy. Whatever I've done with diet has now made me insane. Like, great. Now I'm having hallucinations. Um, but I refused to take my medication again. And it was it was an SSRI. It was at an SSRI at a high dose. But I was like, no, I managed to get rid of it once, which has never happened. I'm going to get back there. Um, I just have to wait. So I just waited. And then over the next week, uh, the depression didn't lift, but I didn't, I didn't hallucinate again. Um, but it was other things started happening. Like, like I said, a week later, my skin broke out and then my arthritis came back. So that was really delayed. The skin breaking out and the arthritis coming back didn't happen right away. The itching happened right away. My mood happened right away. And then I wrote down my symptoms every day um, and just waited. And it was like three and a half weeks and it finally started lift. It started lifting around eight, 18 days after. And then at about day 24, it was gone again. I was like, oh my God. And then for the next year, I just repeated that. So as soon as the depression would go away, I'd reintroduce something else. And then it would just be this, like this, it was a couple times that were almost as bad as the soy time, but I learned pretty quickly not to introduce like a pile of the bad food. Um, it took me about six months. And at, at six months after that, I was only having a teaspoon of it. And about eight months, I was having less than a teaspoon when I reintroduced things. But it took a long time to realize how much really small quantities of things bothered me. So what was your core safe diet at this point? It was sweet potatoes, parsnips, carrots. So like those root vegetables, meats, fish, lettuce, spinach, arugula, apples and pears seemed fine, turmeric, salt, pepper, and then some other spices. I wasn't using like curry powders because they had legumes in them. And uh, I had such a bad experience with soy that I wasn't going to do that again. So it was basically that. It was 
like a re- honey, honey as well. It was a very, very limited autoimmune paleo type diet, which I came across after I found my list of safe foods. And I was like, oh, well, there's definitely something to this because there's so much overlap. There were things on the autoimmune paleo that I couldn't tolerate, but um, ginger was fine too. Yeah, it was a list of 27 foods, but I couldn't seem to introduce anything over that. And I tried it hard for like a year. That's kind of an obvious question. Why did you bother trying? If you've got this group of safe foods, what led you to keep experimenting to try different foods to see if you could add to that? Just purely because you wanted to increase the variety, you're a natural experimenter. What made you put yourself potentially through that that again? Yeah, it was horrible. Um, A couple of things like... One, it was really, really hard to believe that I had somehow just come across a list of 27 foods and those were the only 27 foods I could eat. I was like, that's, I was like, that's weird. That can't be right. So there was that. Um, I put my dad on the diet pretty quickly after my depression lifted because he has the same depression and he was really desperate to get food back. And he was really bad at testing things out. He didn't know when he, he wasn't able to like listen to his body as well as I could. Okay, so you're doing it for him as well. Yeah, like there was one point in the summer and he he'd prob- probably was still having carb, like a lot of carb cravings. So he was like, I'll eat quinoa because he knows a health food. And I was like, don't eat anything that I don't tell you to eat. Uh, and he was eating quinoa and he was eating quinoa all the time. And he was doing really badly, really badly. He wasn't like there when you were talking to him very well. And I was like, okay, got to test out the quinoa. So I had like a teaspoon of quinoa and I had a, horrible reaction to the quinoa. I was like, you got to get rid of the quinoa. And he can see me when I'm like, when he got s- sick from these foods, um, you couldn't see it as much. Like he does get really pale, but that's it. Everything else you can't see. Whereas for me, my skin breaks out and my face got puffy. So you could see it happening to me. So yeah, a lot of it was for dad. Um, but by September, so a year, I thought, no, no more. And I'm could okay. you limit I'm, those reactions? You're saying you just tried a tiny little bit yeah, by doing like that. Could you just have a small reaction? Not really. <laughs> not really. No. I mean, nothing was like this. That's not true. I had a couple that were bad, like soy. But um, the quinoa, it was still horrible. Like I got down to, you know, where like if I'm stuck like this, I want to die. But I know it'll pass. So no, even the small amount seemed really, really problematic. Now I know if it's a really tiny amount, depending on what it is, then it, it'll be okay. The reactions are smaller, but it has to be a really small amount. Even a teaspoon of quinoa was too much. A year after, I thought, I'm not introducing anything for a while because this is exhausting and I can't keep having arthritis. Like I don't want to destroy my joints. And I had a great September. Everything was totally fine. Then I tried to reintroduce sauerkraut because I was like, I was still going along the replenish gut microbiome, like try and heal things. So I tried to reintroduce sauerkraut and I had a horrible reaction to sauerkraut. (laughs) And then I got pregnant and I immediately went back to my safe foods and they didn't work anymore. It was like, as soon as I was pregnant, they didn't work anymore. And I was like, oh no. Do you think that was why? The pregnancy? Yeah. Um, I've had it messed around with the balance a bit in your body. Yeah. I've read a little bit about microbiome changes during pregnancy and it does happen. You get, um, apparently you get a depletion in the biodiversity or in the diversity of your microbiome. So I think that must've been what happened, but it happened really fast. It was like, as soon as I was pregnant, I couldn't get better. I got itchy again and I was itchy and, and then you Google these things and it's like, oh, those are all normal signs of pregnancy. It's like, okay, well, maybe pregnancy is just miserable. I was like arthritic again. My face was puffy. Maybe that's just what being pregnant is like. So I waited. Um, I cut out carbier things. I cut out the apples. I cut out the sweet potatoes. I cut out the parsnips because I noticed that would make me feel a little bit worse. So halfway through the pregnancy, I was just eating salad and meat. And my dad switched to salad and meat too because he noticed that if he ate a whole bunch of sweet potatoes, it would be worse. So then it's salad and meat, and I was doing vitamin infusions just to make sure I was getting everything I needed, but I was still having symptoms. So I gave birth to my daughter, and then my symptoms didn't go away. I was like, okay, so it wasn't the pregnancy. So I'm still itchy. I'm still arthritic, and being arthritic with a baby is the worst. You're waking up all the time at night. Like I couldn't push myself up on the bed with my wrist because my wrist hurt, and picking up the baby was like, my wrist hurts, especially in the early morning, and it was 
so frustrating to get rid of all the symptoms and then to have them come back. And they didn't come back as bad. I was still not on any medication. So I, it wasn't like before when I was in my early 20s, but they, it was there and I was There's itching. always that fear though, isn't there, that it's going to go back to being as bad and it's just going to be stuck with it again. You're going to be stuck with it. And I was like, I wasn't happy. I was depressed, but not depressed enough to, to take medication. But I wasn't happy. And I was like, I used to be happy. I got to a point where I was happy. So how do I get back to that? And I came across Sean Baker, who's like popularized the carnivore diet and decided that day just to go to meat. And I had been putting off going just to meat because I was breastfeeding and because I was getting a lot of hell from my in-laws mostly. So I'd been putting it off, but I saw his Joe Rogan and thought, okay, I'll just do that. And a week later, it really didn't take very long, but um, the itching and the arthritis went away. It's like a week. And my digestion was just distraught with this new diet. I was having diarrhea. I was getting bloated when I ate. And I'd never been bloated doing meat and salad. But now with just meat, I was getting bloated, which didn't make any sense because I didn't have a beef sensitivity. I was like, what is happening? So I quit after a week. <laughs> and it was like, this is obviously stupid. Uh, and I reintroduced, I had a big salad. And the next morning I woke up and I was weepy and I was itchy and my wrists hurt. I was like, really? I have to deal with like, <laughs> what can what? I eat then? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, I have to deal with arthritis or like diarrhea. <laughs> can I have nothing? So I just stuck with it and things improved after about six weeks. It took about six weeks and then my digestion improved. A lot of people seem to have those transition issues. Yeah, it's very normal. Now, now I know um, it's super normal for about two to three weeks. If you're really sick, it can last longer. I think my mom switched over and hers was about four weeks. My dad switched over eventually. He had no transition symptoms. He just dropped salad and then everything improved. So it depends, but it looks like maybe like 60-ish percent of people um, get at least diarrhea when they switch over, bloating, cravings. I didn't really get cravings because I had only dropped salad. So it was a pretty easy transition. But yeah, so I've been eating only meat for like 15 months now and I don't seem to have any symptoms. Wow. Yeah. So, so it, it, it fixed so all it. The, the whole list of everything and your, you know, arthritic pain and everything, all all good. Yeah, all good. All good. I tried to reintroduce um, about three months into the diet. I tried to reintroduce all like organic olives. I thought olive oil is pretty safe. And I had, you know, like quite a few of those um, over a period of two days. And, and I had a reaction to them. I was like, if I can't eat olives, I don't know why I thought that was the safe one because of olive oil. Um, if I can't eat that, I like give up. And then in the last, um, in the last year, there've been a couple times I've been hit at restaurants just with minute quantities of foods. And I do get very minor reactions when that happens. So quantity does matter, but yeah, this you is said like that in the presentation that can just be simply from being cooked on a grill that has something on it. Is, yeah. Is gonna impact yeah. It. I had an experience, um, a couple months ago and I went to a really high end steakhouse and told them, you know, just the steak, nothing on it, scrub the grill and everything. But um, I could, at one point I could taste garlic, but like, I was like, is it in my head or is that garlic? Like it was very minor amount. Um, and I was like, whatever, that'll probably be, you know, I can barely taste it. It'll probably be fine. And the next day I couldn't think at all. Like my head was full of cotton balls, but the depression wasn't back. It was just severe brain fog and I was bloated like four or five months pregnant bloated for like a week my wrists were kind of sore my skin was a little irritated but that was the extent of the reaction which was really scary at the beginning because like I couldn't think and I was like oh my god is the depression going to come back but it didn't but yeah that was just from whatever was on the grill so I asked them like what's what do you usually put on your steak because I was like if there's I was worried, right, about what it could be. And they said, well, usually uh, it's olive oil, salt, and garlic. And I was like, you know, that's hardly anything, right? And they did clean the grill. So, yeah, I'm still ridiculously sensitive and trying to figure out how to reduce that. And so what is your diet composed of now? All meat, meat fats, do you eat fish? You, you don't have dairy, do you? No, so it's not the, like, popularized carnivore diet that's eggs, dairy, and all meat. Um, I'm just eating ruminant meat, beef, um, lamb sometimes, although I don't really like lamb, <laughs> high fat beef. I don't eat lean cuts. I mostly eat ribs, ribeye, about a pound and a half. So I'm like five, six. It seems to depend on how tall you are. I eat about a pound and a half, maybe two. 
a day. I eat twice a day and that just kind of naturally happened. Sometimes I eat once a day and I'll eat more if I eat once a day, but I'm not as good at that. I still get hungry. Yeah, that's what I've been doing for a year and salt. So beef and lamb and salt. And I can do bison and elk. But um, I started, <laughs> this is another strange thing that I've had a really hard time believing. About a month into the carnivore diet, sometimes I was feeling pretty bad after I ate. And I was still eating beef and chicken. And I throughout the, my pregnancy, I had eaten chicken wings like every day. And for some reason, when I switched over to this carnivore diet, I couldn't tolerate chicken anymore. So I was getting brain fog really quickly, like this weird drunken feeling after I had chicken chicken and I was like chicken's my favorite chicken wings that's all I want to eat like I like steak but I really like chicken wings and I tested it out five times because I was like I can't be like no one has this from chicken like, yeah, drunk it's gotta be a chicken. coincidence I'm gonna keep trying <laughs> yeah and I tried turkey and the same thing happened and the other thing is this weird like brain fog drunk feeling I also got from sweet potatoes and apples and I was associating it with um glucose I was like well why is it happening with chicken there's nothing in chicken so yeah, just beef, bison, ruminant meat. And so you enjoy your food. Do you find it restrictive or is it now just so associated with feeling well that all good? Um, Mostly it's all good. Like all my cravings went away. When I was doing low carb, the problem, like, you know, autoimmune paleo type low carb, I still had cravings. So I'd still be like, ah, angel food cake. That was like my main craving, angel food cake. Um, When I went to meat, my cravings went away completely, which is really nice. And I don't overeat ever. I'm just like full and I'll stop. Um, and I think I was probably still overeating a little bit when I was eating plants and apples and things. It's definitely, if I could incorporate in other foods, I probably wouldn't really bother. Maybe like an apple now and then, but I actually like eating this way. It's very simple. Like grocery shopping is very easy. Cooking's really easy. I don't spend any time cooking. I really like steak. Like you don't really get tired of steak. So, uh, no, I like it a lot. The only problem is I'm so sensitive I can't eat out. Like, so if I could go out to a steakhouse with everyone and have a steak, then life would be great. But whatever the underlying problem here that's making me so sensitive, like if that could go away and then I could still do this diet, that would be good. That's the goal is to stick with the diet but to reduce the sensitivities for when I accidentally get hit. And yeah, and maybe it will. You yeah, know, a lot of I people think don't so. say you do it for long enough. Your sensitivities increase, the reactions increase to certain things. But also with the healing that goes on, there might be that little flexibility that is the goal that you're after. Yeah. And then the other thing I should mention, which was has been really interesting, is um, I was diagnosed um, with C. difficile. You heard of C. difficile? Yeah. yeah. I was diagnosed with that um, in the fall and I don't know how long I never. So normally you get that if you're immunosuppressed, if you're, it's like really common in nursing homes, it's common in hospitals, especially for like older immunosuppressed pe people who've been on, uh, lengthy antibiotics. I hadn't taken antibiotics in like years. I'm not immunosuppressed anymore. So I have no idea like how it happened. I didn't have a hospital stay and I've treated it now. I went and did a microbiome transplants in the Bahamas. That was really recent. So that should be gone. But the interesting thing about having a bacterial infection in your gut is it creates gut permeability issues. Right. Okay. So I had that tested and I had my gut permeability tested. And um, they looked at something called zonulin, which is the protein that modulates tight junctions in the gut. So it keeps your cells together in the gut. And my zonulin levels are 12 times as high as they should be. So even though I've been on this high fat meat diet, which has been shown to basically eliminate leaky gut, my gut is ridiculously leaky. And um, I got this tested through my naturopath and he said the clinic had never seen anyone with zonulin levels this high. So I figure maybe I contracted the C. diff at some point, I'm not sure when. And maybe the reason I'm so sensitive, like even the garlic on the grill, that's in, that's insane, right? I could barely taste it. I think maybe part of the reason I'm so sensitive was this infection was increasing my gut permeability to a ridiculous amount. So mm -hmm. anything I eat that for some reason beef is just the, like the safe one and anything else is just like getting into my body. Yeah. So I'm hoping like what my goals are or what my plan is, is to wait, because I just did this um, microbiome transplant treatment, 
I'm going to wait a couple of weeks. I'm going to retest my zonulin levels. And when my zonulin levels get back to like zero, which is where they should be on this diet, I'm going to introduce really small quantities of some sort of plant to see if I can reduce my sensitivity levels. So I'm talking like a pill-sized amount of sweet potato, Mm -hmm. like nothing. I'm hoping that if I do that and give my body a little bit of the like plant toxins, it'll have some sort of buffer. So if I do get hit with something, I'll have some sort of, I think it'll be better anyway, yeah, but I have to wait have, for the zonulin to go down. You need to have that gut flora to digest things. I know yeah. that's part of one of the reasons you get reactions, isn't it? Because if you've, if you've been on an elimination mm. diet, you just don't have the flora there to deal yeah. with things as well. Yeah, yeah, Supposedly, balance. It, it. I mean, it changes. Like right now I'll have a carnivorous microbiome, right? So I went and did this um, microbiome transplant and they're giving me a microbiome from people who can theoretically tolerate a whole bunch of foods. And then I'm on this really limited diet. So they'll stay, apparently they stay alive for a couple of months, but then, then it'll go back to being a carnivorous diet. So um, what I'm doing is I have a number of samples that I took home with me. So I'm waiting. I still need to wait for the zonulin levels to go down before I'm willing to introduce anything, but I'm going to keep giving myself these transplants weekly until my zonulin levels go back down mm-hmm. to like zero and then I'm going to reintroduce. Right. So that's my plan over the next month. And I'm updating people because people are curious to see if you can change. A lot of people go on this all beef diet and then they're stuck on it. So I'm seeing if there's a way to become less sensitive, but I have no idea. And if I can't become less sensitive, I'd still be happy with where I'm at. Yeah, but you just like that bit more flexibility if possible. Yeah, right. And especially my dad, he eats out a lot more than I do. And so he kind of gets hit all the time. Mm. So he's never, you know, I'm probably like nine out of 10 feeling. And he's probably seven out of 10, maybe seven and a half because restaurants just can't cater to something this insanely restrictive, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping we can do something to figure out how to make ourselves less sensitive. So again, it's coming back to that theme of you're not only doing it for yourself, you're doing it for your dad and by the sounds of it, you're doing it for other people out there who yeah. are in similar situations. Yeah. And so where, where can people follow you, find out about what you're doing? I have a blog. It's called Don't Eat That. <laughs> um, MichaelaPeterson.com. I have a YouTube channel. So same thing, Michaela Peterson. Instagram, Michaela Peterson. Perfect. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thanks and, for having especially me on. Especially face-to-face, this is, this is a, a new thing for me, right, with somebody there it's right kind of in fun, front though. of me. I know. It's, I, it's, I'm, it's I'm used really to good. it, like, on a screen, too, yeah. which is different. Which is good, and it's way past not being able to do do it without seeing somebody at all, but yeah. it's a whole different level having yeah. you right here in front of me. It's great. I'm enjoying it. Perhaps you could leave us with a top tip. A top tip? Um, I would say trust your body. That's my top tip. And that was really hard for me to learn. And I mentioned that in my talk today. And it was like, if you think something's wrong, you're probably right. That's what I realized. Cause I, I'd reintroduce foods and be like, oh, my stomach's like a bit bloated. I'm like, it's probably fine. It's like, no, listen to your body. And if you really listen to your body and practice that and don't doubt yourself, you can listen to it enough to figure things out. As long as you clean up your diet enough to, to let you get there. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. To get the resources and links from the show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you want to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and want to help me create new episodes, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash ketowoman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. Please help other people hear about and find this podcast by reviewing the show on my Facebook page and iTunes or whichever podcast app you use. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support means the world to me. Thank you. This week's quote is from Wayne Dyer. If you believe it will work out, you will see opportunities. If you believe it won't, you will see obstacles. Bye bye, keto lovelies. Keto lovelies.